my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, yet another one of our outstanding chief residents. The bar has been set high for some of the amazing presentations that uh, the ones I've missed, I have to say, it's, they're one of the few actual grand rounds I have spent the whole time watching on the videotape. So it's really been a, a privilege to uh, have our chief residents uh, present. I'm proud to present uh, Dr. Laura Goodman, who has been with us now for almost seven years, uh, completing seven years at UC Davis. The uh, uh, proud of Laura in many ways in our early days of developing our global health program here. She has been one of our leaders, was our first Fulbright Scholar at UC Davis, uh, and went off and did her uh, Fulbright Fellowship at uh, in Mongolia, which we're going to hear a little bit about today. I hope she'll be uh, leading the pack for many future Fulbright scholars to come uh, from our program. And she will be uh, next year going to Loma Linda, Southern California, for her pediatric surgery fellowship. And it's going to tell us a little bit today about the development of children's surgery. So, Laura, really proud to have you. Thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for being here and for the opportunity to present. This is actually my second Grand Rounds. I decided not to just reuse my presentation from when I was a second year. Um, but I took this opportunity to investigate this specialty that I'm going into. I don't have any disclosures, um, but a couple of caveats. I can't cover all of global surgery um, or the contributions that a lot of the faculty in this room have made. I'll just cover the areas that I've been involved in. The outline is listed here, not a surprising structure. Um, but what may be surprising is uh, ancient history is not the first thing you might think of when you think about children's surgery. Um, but like with most human endeavors, surgery, including surgery on kids, has been going on for a surprisingly long time. Uh, it's shown on the left. These are adult skulls, but tray fanning is one of the earliest surgical practices. This was begun probably between 10,000 and 2000 BC, and surprisingly, quite a lot of patients survived. A study in the World Journal of Neurosurgery from last year found that long-term survival measured by bone healing was up to 91 percent um, between 1000 and 1400 CE in what is now Peru. Later samples from the Inca period showed a survival of 75 to 83%, and some of the patients included children. So they healed in the era before anesthesia, before antiseptic, before uh, antibiotics from having their skulls cut open, sometimes for injury, but not always. Um, then on the right side, this is a technique that might be familiar. This is an illustration of circumcision. Maybe the earliest illustration of surgery, this bow relief from Egypt is from about 2500 BC. All this just to say that people have been trying to do surgery for a very long time. <coughs> Our word surgery in English comes from the Greek, herugikie, uh, which means handwork. And this is the treatment of disease, injury, or deformity by manual or instrumental operations. You can see in this Greek bowl, um, Achilles is doing manual operation um, to fix the fracture, so probably here. Um, but it's the codification of techniques that really characterizes surgery as we know it now. That is writing down what we do and making it fairly standard. This goes way back as well to the sixth century in ancient India. The image here on the right shows uh, rhinoplasty that was done. This illustration is from an 18th century British magazine, but this was written down in the 6th century in India in a compendium of surgery by a surgeon named Sushruta. And the demand for rhinoplasty then was present because people got their noses cut off for adultery. So, um, <laughs> Interesting side note, but um, this text described 125 different surgical instruments. It described treatment for cleft lip, for imperforate anus, um, for bladder stones in children through perineal incision, um, and he described vesicouretal reflux in exquisite detail. Um, European practitioners from which our tradition comes really owe their introduction to these techniques um, to this original text, which was brought to Europe through the Middle East um, in Arabic translations. A quote that I really liked from this, um, from Sushruta, was that only the union of medicine and surgery constitutes the complete doctor. 
a doctor who lacks knowledge of one of these branches is like a bird with only one wing. <laughs> Apologies to anyone who's not going to be a surgeon in this room. <laughs> um, so around the world, concern for the health of children is universal. And I gave some of the long history of surgical intervention on kids. It goes back to the Talmud as well. There's descriptions in that text of treatment for low imperforate anus by rubbing the perineum with oil and using a barley corn to cut through the transparent area of the skin. And shown here is probably the earliest illustrated textbook. Um, hard to pronounce the title of it. I think it's something like Jiraye Ilhanye uh, by a 15th century Turkish physician. And this shows attempted treatment of imperforate anus on the left side and then drainage of hydrocephalus. The survival of those are unknown. But anyway, our uh, traditions of surgery come down from this um, through the Middle Ages, through the itinerant barber surgeons. Uh, some of those surgeons have been critiqued. Um, maybe they needed to be itinerant to stay a few days ahead of their complications. Um, that'll come up again when I talk about mission surgeons later on. But on the left side here, there's an image of Amboise Paré. So he was at the opposite end of the spectrum. He was a very well-respected surgeon to four French kings. He stayed in one place. And actually, he set the stage for a lot of our surgical practices. He studied his patients uh, and watched what worked and what didn't. When there was a shortage of oil to cauterize wounds on the battlefield, he observed that the patients who he had ligated their vessels actually did better. Fewer of them died and had sepsis. And so he proposed ligation of vessels in the course of amputation or severe injuries um, as an effective intervention. He also opposed hernia repair in kids, which is interesting at the time, um, because it usually involved orchiectomy. So he supported it only when there was strangulation or incarceration. Um, he treated kids, you can see here the illustration of cleft lip and palate, um, as well as for other procedures. A lot of different quotes or aphorisms are attributed to him, including the one shown on the Canadian Association of Pediatric Surgery logo here, which is Je le pense de you le guéri, or I treated him and God healed him, which is an inspiration for humility among surgeons, is how I take that, to say that we don't have the ultimate responsibility. But Coming from this tradition of Paré, he made great progress, but it took another 400 years until surgery would become something that we would recognize today, with the first surgery journals appearing in France and Germany around 1850. In the 19th century in the United States, meanwhile, a lot of the surgeons went to Europe to get their training in the scientific, uh, scientifically based tradition and in rigorous settings. And that included Halstead, uh, it wasn't until 1883 the first journals appeared in the United States. And then everyone knows about the Halsteadian model of surgical training that standardized uh, who could become surgeons. The Flexner Report led to the improvement of medical training in the schools and closure of a lot of substandard schools for medicine. And then we had the American College of Surgeons. And in 1927, the first standards for graduation in surgery, followed by the American Board of Surgery after that. Pediatric surgery came after that, but it was a similarly long course of development. The first uh, journal in pediatric surgery was published in 1966, and this paved the way for the establishment of the American Pediatric Surgical Association after that. Interestingly, in the new journal, they asked a non-pediatric surgeon to write the introduction to give it some um, respectability. This was I.S. Ravden, who was a president of the American College of Surgeons and chair of Penn Surgery. And he wrote in this introduction that pediatric surgery has reached the place when we must admit that it now deserves to rank with the other specialties concerned with the particular problems of treating specific types of patients. So this is all relatively recent. Um, what we see during this the period since then is that the survival from common congenital anomalies has really improved. Um, from intestinal atresia that you see on the upper left there, um, Dr. J. Alex Haller, a former chief of pediatric surgery at Johns Hopkins, described just the broad <laughs> overview here of survival from intestinal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and omphalocele. 
These are really stunning improvements based on the development of techniques, based on the support from other um, factors like parenteral nutrition and ECMO, but really amazing progress. The recognition of the field itself, I mentioned with the founding of the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, but there was a lot of pushback against it, notably the founder of Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, which was the premier, is the premier treatment center for kids. The founder and surgeon, Sir Dennis Brown, said that the field of surgery of children wasn't worth studying. It's an ancillary field for adult surgeons. And Mark Ravitch, a pediatric surgeon who also was an adult surgeon at Johns Hopkins, said that you could never make a living being a pediatric surgeon, you needed to make your living doing adult surgery and do surgery for kids on the side. Um, just a note about these images too, Gertrude Hertzfield is someone um, who's not extremely prominent in the history, but is very important. She was a, the first woman pediatric surgeon. She practiced in Edinburgh, obviously a very long time ago. She started practicing around the 1920s and she started day surgery or what we call same day surgery for kids. So they didn't have enough hospital rooms for all the pediatric hernia patients that she wanted to fix. And she's said to have been very fast at fixing them. Um, one report was six hernias in an hour. Um, and then, so they had no place to put the kids and sent them home and they did better being at home, being fed by their mothers versus kept in the hospital um, without that. So she made some interesting contributions and then I had to put a picture of Dr. Ladd on here, um, who is the author with Dr. Gross of the first textbook in the United States of pediatric surgery. Um, so the first institutional recognition came from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This was interesting as a surgical section of pediatric surgery rather than its own institution. So the criticism was that these may not be surgeons, they're just pediatricians who can actually operate. So um, later the British Association was formed, the Journal of Pediatric Surgery, the Canadian Association, and then in 1970, the American Pediatric Surgical Association. And finally, in 1973, it became possible to be board certified in pediatric surgery. Since then, there have been a lot of organizations developing across the world, more journals, <laughs> et cetera. So we have an excellent example of the possibilities of pediatric surgery and the improving survival from the congenital anomalies that I showed from the 1950s up to the 2000s, but the progress is not universal. It's not around the world. It's very uneven. This is just one example um, of gastroschisis. So in Cote d'Ivoire and Uganda, in one study, the mortality was 100%. Uh, during the same study period, the mortality in the UK was 0%. On average, it's 1% in the US and the UK. So when I was in Mongolia, which I'll talk about a little bit later, I saw about 30% mortality from gastroschisis. How does surgery fit into global health and addressing these disparities that I mentioned? Uh, it's been recognized as an essential part of primary care since at least 1980, when Halfdan Mahler, who is Director General of the World Health Organization, told the International College of Surgeons that this is an important part of primary care and it can't be separated from primary care. But there wasn't a whole lot of change based on that until you get to the early 2000s. Um, Paul Farmer, who's an um, internist, infectious disease specialist, I believe, um, who's been very well known for his work through Partners in Health at Harvard, working in Haiti to improve um, the medical care there. He famously called surgery in Africa the neglected stepchild of global health and pointed out that investing in more surgical capacity, training surgeons would lead to great improvements in uh, global health generally. Then in 2015, there were a lot of big changes. The disease control priority volume on surgery um, as a standalone volume was published for the first time as a reference for governments, the World Health Organization, practitioners around the world, the World Health Assembly voted and passed this resolution that declared that essential um, surgery is an uh, inseparable component of universal health care and should be provided. And then the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery was initiated to describe the burden of disease, the cost effectiveness, ways in which the uh, surgical capacity can be improved. So I have a short 
video here that describes some of that background of the disease burden that's avertible with surgery. Over the past two decades, global health has focused on individual diseases. Surgical care has been afforded low priority in the world's poorest regions, leaving 5 billion people without access to safe, affordable surgical and anesthesia care. Patients requiring surgical treatment will face multiple hurdles. Delay in seeking care. Delay in reaching care. Delay in receiving care. Reaching the hospital does not guarantee treatment, as many lack the proper infrastructure to provide emergency surgical care. As a result, many easily treatable conditions become diseases with high fatality rates. As many as 90% of maternal deaths could be averted by timely intervention. For those who successfully obtain treatment, one quarter will experience financial catastrophe as a result of receiving surgical care. To save lives and prevent disability, an additional 143 million surgical procedures are required annually in developing countries. Today's surgical workforce would need to double in 15 years to reach our target of 80% coverage of timely access to essential services by 2030. The total costs required to reach these targets are significant at approximately $350 billion by 2030. However, the costs of failure are even greater. The lost output will cost developing countries an estimated $12.3 trillion. Investing in surgical services is affordable, saves lives and promotes economic growth, making surgery an indivisible, indispensable part of healthcare. About 90% is the um, statistic they give of maternal deaths could be averted by access to surgery. So just having the capability to do a cesarean section. Um, treatment of open fractures is another um, procedure they focus on as a bellwether or an indicator of if uh, a particular area has the capability to provide the most basic and essential surgical care. And then um, the last one is laparotomy. So they cite, again, the statistics of um, potential averted disability. They think, or cite in this video, that 143 million more surgical procedures are needed every year in order to uh, avert these disabilities and deaths. So why is there such a disparity in outcomes between high and low income countries? It's very multifactorial and complex, as you might imagine, but surgery is resource and socially intensive. That is a lot of why there's been a delay in improvement in surgical care. It requires stable infrastructure and supplies. It requires long-term training and financial support. And the effects of colonialism in a lot of these developing countries that were colonies are still being felt. As Heinz Road notes in the introduction to this pediatric surgery textbook for Africa, the same surgical diseases seen in the developed world must be diagnosed and treated under less favorable and often adverse circumstances. The morbidity and mortality rates remain unacceptably high, and there are wide disparities between developing countries as well as between urban and rural communities in those countries. So these disparities inspire a lot of medical professionals, students, um, to go and help in the Global South on mission trips. And I am one of those people who is inspired to go and try to help. It's done out of good intentions, and there are good results. But like I mentioned before about itinerant barber surgeons, um, mission surgeons run the risk of being seen as staying just a few days ahead of their complications. Um, capacity building and genuine alliances and collaborations are essential to meeting long-term needs. Um, so I've illustrated a few of the principles here. This follows from the Grand Round talks that I gave in February 2014. That was following on uh, four weeks that I spent at Muhambili Hospital in Dar es Salaam with Dr. Holcroft. Um, that rotation was founded by Bill Schechter, a general surgeon at San Francisco General, who's now retired. Um, but he set up the Alliance for Global Clinical Training and established this site with the idea that 
If you send a rotating cast of surgeons from the Pacific Coast Surgical Society who have the same training and background, in essence, being certified in the United States, to this site, that you could have this longitudinal institutional partnership creating accountability, um, follow up on the results, and really meet the needs of the local surgeons and trainees and patients. Um, when I talked in 2014, I was focused on how to make the resident experience valuable for trainees and patients and host institutions, and most importantly, how to do no harm uh, with doing this work. I remember from being in Muhimbili that in the operating room one day, one of the Tanzanian interns said to me, do you get to operate in the United States? Because you come here to practice, right? This is where you come to learn to operate. Um, so I knew what he was talking about. I had been on medical missions um, in Mexico as a pre-medical student. I had gone down with a dental group and helped with dental extractions. Um, I wasn't doing anything skilled, obviously, as a pre-medical student. I was just there to help, but still, you know, I had some responsibility there um, and didn't go back to follow up those patients who got their teeth pulled out. Um, this pattern um, can, like I said, lead to that perception that people from the global north are going to practice in this global south. Um, there is a sort of shorthand that my husband and I have for this, which is putting your help on people rather than helping them and bringing them up. It kind of can seem that you're just dumping your help wherever it might best fit. Um, so the Paris Declaration, which I've illustrated in the upper left here, um, gives sort of a framework for addressing this. The top left shows ownership, um, which means that partner countries set the agenda and ask for the help um, as the first step. There has to be alignment between the donors and the partner systems, shown in the upper right, um, so that there's not undermining or duplication. Anyone who's visited a developing world hospital has probably seen a closet full of disused equipment, old laparoscopy towers that aren't compatible. There's no power supply for them. They don't fit with the light cords they have um, because it you know, just doesn't, doesn't fit there. And that's just the um, supply illustration of it. There are a lot of... Uh, larger level systems as well. On the lower left, harmonization uh, means that donor efforts uh, correlate. They don't just um, duplicate the efforts and come the next day not realizing that there had just been a group of surgeons from the US uh, the day prior. Um, and sharing information and establishing common arrangements for common goals. And then results in the lower right here is the key part of looking at uh, monitoring and evaluating progress to see if what you're doing is actually making a difference and revising and adjusting uh, accordingly. And all of this is united by mutual accountability for efforts to make sure um, that these are not one-off, um, you know, just practice for people coming from richer countries. And then on the right side here, um, just a basic illustration that at a minimum, global health efforts need to be ethical um, within those, there will be some that are actually effective, and then within those, there are fewer that are sustainable. So th those are the goals. Um, I wanted to show this illustration here from 1885 um, from Shanghai showing a missionary surgeon um, just to show the background of medical missions in the colonial health services. So this is a Dr. Reichsneider, who is a graduate of the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia. Um, illustrated here, performing what was called a variotomy in the text. Um, unclear where that mass is actually originating. Um, but she's unusual in being a woman surgeon and doing mission work at that time, but not um, unusual in um, following European colonies. European doctors or American doctors would go and provide care for um, the people <coughs> from those colonizing countries. Um, Missionaries fit in many different uh, categories as listed there, but the um, efforts are changing. Research, which was formerly called Interplast, gives a great example of that. They completely retooled their formerly medical mission-oriented work um, to be focused on training. Their model now is to train up local surgeons to provide the care that they formerly were providing by fly-in medical missions. There's a lot of good literature developing out there about the costs of medical missions um, and the uh, benefits that can be had from training local surgeons. 
So the focus areas that I'll cover um, in particular in global surgery include research, um, the workforce, infrastructure development, and policy or advocacy. And these were focus areas prioritized by providers in a new organization that I was lucky to be involved with um, over the last couple of years. Uh, this is the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. So as you might know, Dr. Farmer was president of the American Pediatric Surgical Association recently, and this started as her presidential initiative. Um, so I was in the right place at the right time to get involved with this and help Jake's, as we call it, to develop. This formed with a vision that every child in the world who has a surgical need should have the resources, access to those resources, to get the care that they need. Um, this is a consortium of providers that includes institutions and um, other allies, non-providers from around the world, from high-income and low-income countries. And um, all the members are united by the belief that this, um, not only do kids deserve to have access to care, but that there are commonalities between the different areas of surgical care. It's not just pediatric surgery. Kids need neurosurgery sometimes. They need cardiac surgery. They need anesthesiologists to help make these, um, the needed procedures possible. And it also includes nurses, physical therapists, anyone involved in the global surgical care of children. It has a purposefully egalitarian structure um, with the idea that, as I talked about with the Paris Declaration, that the projects or efforts should be selected by and led by local experts. Um, the first meeting to bring together providers and implementers of these surgical services happened at the Royal College of Surgeons in London, shown in the upper left there in June of 2016. And the priorities that came out of that were to one, analyze the current state of surgical care for children to set the baseline, and then to set priorities um, at the global, national, regional, even local levels. And then finally, to bring together resources to address those priorities. Um, as a result of that first meeting, a lot of new collaborations were formed. People continued to work together um, until the second meeting, which was in Washington, D.C. at the American College of Surgeons, um, and then from there continued on until the third meeting in Velour, uh, which happened in January 2018. Meanwhile, um, Guy Jensen helped to incorporate this as a 501c3, put a ton of work into doing that. And then um, Jamie Anderson helped with the organization of this third one here. Um, I can't cover all the results of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery here, but a few of them include um, 13 national needs assessments, uh, which contributed to writing the optimal resources for children's surgery with the international focus separate from the United States um, optimal resources for children's surgery um, verification project. Um, but this optimal resources is a guide for development. Um, Dr. Nima Kaseje and colleagues are working in Nicaragua on the Surgery for the People project funded by the UBS Optimus Foundation, working with Operation Smile. Dr. Naomi Wright is collaborating with thousands of providers across 116 countries to do a prospective cohort study on the management and outcomes of congenital anomalies. And that's across mid low, middle, and high income countries. And then in Somaliland, Ms. Edna Adan Ismail served as a key link and collaborator for a research project led by Tessa Concepcion as a med, uh, MPH student and Henry Rice and Emily Smith assessing the surgical needs in Somaliland. For workforce, uh, Trainings have been started in collaborations through cancer care, uh, as well as general pediatric surgery and neurosurgery. The third meeting I showed the photo of from Velour actually included a, a neurosurgery training led by William Harkness. And then for infrastructure development, Gix has been collaborating with a Scottish-based NGO called Kids OR, which has uh, built operating rooms to support local pediatric surgeons across nine countries so far, shown in green with um, additional operating rooms planned in the location shown on this map. On the policy and advocacy side, I mentioned the optimal resources for children's surgery before, um, and then national surgical plans are being developed at the same time. And the fourth meeting for gigs is planned for January 2020 in South Africa. Now to change gears a little bit, my personal contribution to research has been in, uh, focused in Mongolia which the first question is, where is that? <laughs> it's right there. It's in Central Asia, uh, across the Pacific. And I uh, started writing grants 
to fund research there and focusing on that while I was here working in Dr. Farmer's lab on fetal sheep in my first research year and I was starting my MPH at the same time um, and found that the hours of research years are not so much different than the clinical hours. <laughs> um, I realized, and the reason I was pursuing the MPH um, and writing these grants was that I thought one of the more durable contributions that I could make as a practitioner, particularly a practitioner in training without a completed um, surgical um, board certification, that the best thing I could do was do research and establish the baseline and bring my resources from grants to low resource areas and try to assist where I could with training. So. I chose to focus on um, epidemiology to improve my skills there and also be able to share them and did this at Harvard. Um, a further note on Mongolia, the reason I chose it um, was that I had been a Peace Corps volunteer there uh, before going to med school and had a leg up on the language for that reason. <coughs> a little bit about the country, it's in Central Asia as I showed, it has just 3.1 million people across an area the size of Alaska. So it's one of the least densely populated countries on earth, which came um, to be really important in doing our assessments. Um, and a lot of the population is young, as you see on the left side here. And many people still live in uh, gares, or we usually call them yurts, these canvas tents, uh, which are heated by burning wood or coal or tires, if you can't afford the first two. And half of the people in the in the capital still live in these structures. Um, so I'll get back to that in a little bit. Here was our planned research routes. Um, this was to cover all of the country, um, part of it because it is so dispersed in terms of population. Uh, it's about 1,500 kilometers from the capital. Um, I don't know if I can show that here. Oh. Um, the capital is here, so about 1,500 kilometers to go all the way across to here, which is where I was as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, so most of these uh, paths are not roads, really. They're dirt, dirt ways that you go. Um, so it was important that we have an adequate vehicle. Um, I was lucky to get funding um, to be able to hire a driver with his four-wheel drive van and snorkel. Um, we really did need that. <laughs> uh, we got stuck in the mud a little bit had flat tires. Our, we had a Prius with us for part of the trip, and that actually made it across the mud field better than the four-wheel drive right here. Uh, but the, the places where kids go to get care are very uh, far apart and difficult to traverse the distances between. There is no set-up transport system there to take kids from the rural areas where they live into the capital. So that was part of our motivation here. Um, the research aims were set up with um, my local collaborators who are shown here, Dr. Erka uh, on the left, who's a pediatric surgeon there, Dr. Sanchen, who's a general laparoscopic surgeon, and Dr. Burma next to me there, who's a pediatric anesthesiologist by training, all um, Mongolian practitioners. So we started with this aim of defining pediatric surgical capacity at the provincial centers across the country, knowing that transportation is a challenge. We went at one of the easier times of the year, uh, and it was still difficult. If you have a child who's sick in the winter months when everything is frozen, it's 40 below, um, or it's all mud, um, getting that child to adequate care would be difficult. So we wanted to set up the baseline of what care can be provided locally for these kids. And then the subsequent aims all relate to uh, what was at first my backup plan in case um, uh, I wasn't able to do the assessments across the entire country. So these all relate to congenital anomalies, um, using data in the capital um, to determine the prevalence of birth of major congenital anomalies and the associated factors. Our methods included um, site visits, like I mentioned, to each of the um, hospitals and collecting data using an established uh, survey with the difference with our survey being that we were there to verify that supplies and personnel were present. Um, and then calculating the summary scores and the index and looking at associated factors. To look at the prevalence at birth of congenital anomalies, we got the national registry data for two years and used that. Um, and then also got the national birth registry. Um, 
I was able to merge those databases with some difficulty. They're all written in Mongolian. Obviously, it's the, as the primary language of that country, um, it was not translated for me. So that was a bit of a learning curve. But um, we were able to get those merged and then to calculate the congenital anomaly statistics based on the merged data. To summarize our findings for pediatric surgical capacity from 21 public <laughs> hospitals across the country, um, I've shown here each of the regions in a different color. Um, and then on the far right of each grouping is the summary score. The index for each of the hospitals ranged from 7.2 to 14.2. Um, there was no significant difference in the regional means, though there was a trend toward um, higher index in the area shown in blue there. That's the northern region. That just happens to be the most wealthy region of the country uh, where there are large mines um, in the north. And uh, I won't go into detail about the personnel, um, but there were just two pediatric surgeons outside of the capital. Um, and one of the hospital had no anesthesiologist. There are no uh, intermediate anesthesia providers in Mongolia. Um, and to note about procedures, only nine of the hospitals across the country had the capability of removing uh, foreign bodies um, from kids, aspirated or ingested foreign bodies. Uh, just seven of them treated pyloro, pyloro or did pyloromyotomy for pyloric stenosis, sorry. And just seven treated abdominal well defects. So um, it uh, leaves a lot of room for improvement in, the, in that sense. Um, and we have a lot of trauma surgeons in this program to note, just one hospital had pediatric sized chest tubes. Um, the other ones did not. Um, So the map on the right here, again, just demonstrates the same data. The highest um, index is shown in red, the lowest in blue with a gradient in between. There was no discernible pattern to um, the index as the summary score of what is available in each hospital. Uh, then just to illustrate again, on a scatter plot here, distance from the capital, um, if transportation is such an issue, perhaps the distance would account for the difference in uh, capability, and it didn't. Now, changing gears, this, um, <laughs> this was the setting for my research on congenital anomalies. Uh, this is a view from the operating room, actually, but the hospital where I did the research. You can see the air pollution just hanging there. Um, if anyone's been to Salt Lake, it's somewhat similar to that. Mountains rim the city, and it is rather cold in the winter, so colder here. And there's an inversion effect, so the cold air just sits, and the pollution um, hangs around the city all winter long. I mentioned half the population still lives in those felt tents, and they burn um, whatever they have to stay warm. And the coal-fired power plants and heating plants are all right here in the same bowl. Um, so all of that pollution sits there. And in the hospital, sometimes it would just get too hot. There's centralized Soviet planned heating. Um, so they would open up the windows to cool it off. Um, and I could see the smoke just tumbling in through the windows into the children's hospital when they uh, would open them up. And you know, my coworkers and kids, most people didn't wear masks. It was really easy to pick out foreigners in the city in the winter because we were all wearing N99 filtration masks. Um, some people um, who are Mongolian are starting to do that. There's a lot more agitation now about um, air pollution, trying to reduce it, trying to mitigate the effects of it. Um, people are donating air filters to the children's hospital to try to make the air healthier for the kids. But um, it's still a very big problem. And a lot of my coworkers and the public, when I told them what I was doing in Mongolia, um, would tell me they think that this air pollution is responsible for a lot of the birth defects, and they think that the rates are increasing. What I found um, for the congenital anomalies was a rate of just 7.6 per thousand live births in 2014, and then 8.6 in 2015. When I combined the data sets, the passive reporting system with the National Birth Registry, I identified additional cases, um, but was only able to get to 10.3 cases per 1,000. Um, for reference, this compares to the expected value of 54 per 1,000. 
So to look at it by organ system, heart and circulatory anomalies were by far the most commonly reported. Um, nervous system defects would be expected to be first or second most common based on other country and worldwide data. But you can see the second most commonly reported here were cleft lip and palate followed by digestive anomalies. Um, I'm not gonna show all the regression results from looking at the um, risk factors for these, but I'll just go to surgically correctable examples. Why am I talking about congenital anomalies? Um, a lot of them are surgically correctable. The WHO um, has written that more than 60% of congenital anomalies are uh, in a single organ or organ system or limb, um, which may make them amenable to surgically, uh, surgical correction. So just a couple of examples for hydrocephalus um, in the data set. Uh, there were 26 cases. These were marked by the reporting physician as treatable with surgery or not. Um, they had reported 30.8% were treatable with surgery, 34.6% um, had multiple anomalies, and 38.5% of these babies had died within 28 days of birth. For gastroschisis, which I had mentioned before, there were 16 cases, and 68.8% uh, were marked treatable, just 11.8% had multiple anomalies, and 31.3% had died by 28 days after birth. So to summarize the data uh, from the congenital anomaly study here, the highest estimate from the data combining the different data sources was 10.3 per 1,000 live births. And this compares to 60 per 1,000 globally, uh, 30 per 1,000 in the United States. The March of Dimes estimate is the one that I gave before, 54 per 1,000. They don't have a more recent estimate since 2006. So under ascertainment um, is probably the most important factor at play here in a passive reporting system. Um, but there could be other factors as well that are leading to this low reported rate. Um, the most common anomalies are listed there. So switching again. So Mongolia is a really small country. <laughs> and this is kind of the embarrassing slide. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, so if you stay in the capital long enough as a foreigner, you will run into the other foreigners who live in that country. <laughs> so um, also being a Fulbright scholar, um, I was asked to give an interim report for the US ambassador that's shown in the picture on the right there. Um, while I was there, I met one of the local news personalities um, who has a show called Jargle De Facto. Um, his name is Jargle. And you can see that on the cup there, and the snippet from the interview that I did, um, and that's the transliteration of my name in Mongolian um, at the top <laughs> with my little CV. Um, so <laughs> it's an interesting just comment for me on what I need to learn to get better at doing TV interviews is not easy. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of skill that goes into it that you don't think about coming from medicine or science, things like that. Um, so room for improvement there. <laughs> um, switching again. So global surgery isn't just in developing countries. Um, there is a lot of need in other places as well. Um, I went to Germany along the way to Mongolia to do research for a month in Dresden in my um, first research year. And I was interested because I'd come in contact with a, a physician who runs a refugee clinic there. And uh, Germany had received over a million asylum seekers in 2015. So I was interested to characterize the uh, problems of the refugees in this clinic, and it also gave me a chance to um, practice epidemiology in a useful, useful way. Um, I just have a little bit of the information here to focus on kids. Um, I have the data from the adults um, that was published separately, but just 13% of the kids in this clinic uh, had uh, surgical diagnoses, and they're listed here. The most common were abscess, inguinal hernia, hydrocele, and appendicitis. Now, additional directions for research, especially in Mongolia, um, include more geospatial analyses of uh, surgical capacity and of need. This is a nice uh, study done by Emily Smith and colleagues. Um, I mentioned her before with GIX. Um, they found that districts with a high prevalence of unmet surgically, surgical need 
uh, had low availability of care. So this illustrates some um, various aspects of the availability of care, the distance from the closest surgical center, the travel time to reach tertiary care, um, and care availability. Next, I'll cover workforce um, and a few different approaches and talk about why it's necessary to cover workforce about pediatric surgery in particular. <coughs> so kids are, of course, not just little adults. This is a study from um, Aga Khan University Hospital in Pakistan that uh, looked at kids with emergency general surgery conditions. And they uh, did this study from 2009 to 2014, looking at all the um, kids who had these uh, whole list of diagnoses that qualified as emergency general surgery. The kids were treated by adult general surgeons sometimes and by pediatric surgeons at other times, um, just depending on who was on call when they came in. And they found that there was a higher odds of complications for kids who were treated by adult surgeons. Um, they also found that they had a higher uh, risk of having a prolonged length of stay. Uh, with the odds ratio shown there. A significant portion of pediatric surgery in the US and in Africa across the world is done by general surgeons. So I think there's a lot of room to do further research on this particular topic, what the outcomes are. Now, the American Pediatric Surgical Association recommends that there be one pediatric surgeon per 100,000 patients um, from zero to 15 years. And this table just shows the uh, deficiencies by country um, in this study by Churdun um, and colleagues. So they calculated the deficiency based upon the recommended number. Um, the lowest on here is Malawi. Um, if I can make this go here. Um, so on this lower part here, you can see that they calculated a deficiency of 31 pediatric surgeons for Malawi because they currently have one pediatric surgeon for almost six million people shown here, um, six million kids. So that's the lower end of the uh, need that they've identified. At the higher end at the top, you can see Nigeria. Uh, this graph from a paper by Tubai and colleagues just illustrates, um, again, what I said, that the pediatric surgery is not always done by pediatric surgeons. And it takes a long time to become a pediatric surgeon. And there is no international standard. There's no exchangeability. Um, I listed some of the training times here. Interestingly, in the UK, it takes eight years to become a general surgeon as well. So it's the two core foundation years and then six specialty years, just like for pediatric surgery. And in Mongolia, it takes two years and six months to become a pediatric surgeon. Now, most of the general surgeons there who've done their two years um, and the pediatric surgeons go on to work in hospitals in the capital where they function on an apprenticeship model. So as junior faculty, they're operating with senior faculty and really continuing their training. But those surgeons who are sent out to rural areas uh, often don't have that opportunity to have mentorship and have senior colleagues take them through cases. Um, I ran into a situation when I was traveling through one of the um, more isolated provinces with my team. We were with the university um, <coughs> team that was conducting educational workshops as well. But the surgeon there had a trauma patient with bilateral hemoneumothoraces um, that had been sitting there for two days. He didn't know how to put in a chest tube. It wasn't part of his surgical training in the two years. Um, and he didn't have any senior mentors to ask um, or anyone who could help him out. So. Um, I wasn't allowed to operate as a Fulbright fellow in Mongolia under the terms of that, um, that training program. But um, what I could do was talk him through it. Um, and a local anesthesiologist who was there as part of the university team had done uh, extensive work in emergency rooms, putting in chest tubes elsewhere. So he was able to help hands on. We used up the last two atria, the only two in that hospital to drain the guy's chest. Um, but um, at least he was able to get that treatment. And the bigger benefit that I saw from that particular interaction is now that surgeon has the contact of surgeons who are Mongolian in the capital to be able to just reach out and send a text and say, can you help me with this and just talk me through it. So he at least has some link now. Um, to talk about infrastructure and policy briefly, um, charitable, charitable development is important, as in this kids OR, which is making great progress, but there has to be a sustainability plan to avoid having disused space or equipment that doesn't have adequate staff or supplies. 
This picture shows um, the one-time use laparoscopic equipment being sterilized for reuse in the Philippines um, when I was there as a medical student. Um, and I mentioned before, anyone who visits a developing country hospital, if you look around long enough, you will find a closet with all the disused equipment that doesn't work that's been donated. Um, so the international and national prioritization can be that link to lead to sustainable funding sources. So the research in developing countries focusing on global surgery, kid surgery in particular, um, has a goal of improving access to and quality of care. Hopefully, by establishing current conditions, as in Mongolia, with that baseline, we can work to improve those conditions. And the observation can change what you're observing. And hopefully, um, you know, as when we get inspections here, you know, not everyone thinks JCO improves our care, but <laughs> there is a panic around the inspection to improve the way we're doing things, and that happens everywhere. You know, the inspectors are coming, you make sure everything is cleaned up and nice. If you're having um, observation, even by researchers with no um, authority of any kind, still it, it might, make, um, might make you question what you're doing. And what we found is the hospitals were um, grateful to, people working there were grateful to be able to compare themselves with other uh, hospitals and other practitioners across the country so they could know how they were doing. Um, Collaborative and dispersed efforts like the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery are key for sustainability um, to make sure that the institution or organization can continue the work when other people move on. Um, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery has really blossomed as an example to um, just continue that work across a lot of different people for the last couple of years. Um, and then there are a lot of common challenges between underserved rural areas in the US and other developed countries and these developing countries like in Mongolia that I described. Um, so that there are lessons to be learned abroad that can be brought back here. As Dr. Farmer mentioned, um, in August I'll start as the Pediatric Surgery Fellow at Loma Linda University. Um, this shows the new adult and children's hospital. There's a pediatric hospital back here with the rainbow glass. Um, that's supposed to serve one quarter of the geographic area of California. Um, that's this huge area in the Inland Empire. And that has some commonalities with Mongolia with the dispersed population. So again, there may be some common lessons um, that can be learned there. Um, and then I'm grateful I've had the opportunities that I have to train here, um, that I could train as a general surgeon, that I've learned from my patients. I've had the opportunities to learn in other places um, and from my colleagues as well. And again, I couldn't become a surgeon without the patients teaching me and allowing me to work with them. Um, finally, in other places, um, people you meet might not realize that they're teaching you. I've learned a lot here and abroad that I didn't expect to. Um, <laughs> and wherever you are, um, this quote from the late Malian physician Ali Farkaturi captures it well. Wherever you're from, that's the center of the world. <laughs> And it's um, important to keep that in mind, wherever our patients are from. So with that, I'll end. Thanks for your attention. Well, I'm so proud of all the work you've done. Um, I think you were a bit self-effacing, as has always been your style, that uh, most of that work with Dick could not have been done without Laura and Guy and really uh, Jamie picking up the mantle following that. And um, you had an extraordinary productive time and we expect great things of you in the future. So Thanks. thank you so much really for that. We probably have time for one question. Anybody wants to ask what that is? <laughs> <laughs> and didn't you tell me that you in fact, that was some of the mode of transportation to get into <laughs> your patients to do that work? <laughs> We did find these along the road. <laughs> Luckily, our driver knew how to talk to the camels. Like, you have to tell them to kneel down so you can get on top of them to ride them. So. <laughs> and I'm wearing my surgery jacket. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Maybe the furthest yes. long place is someone to worn one of those. <laughs> Global health uh, <laughs> people across yeah. the cosmos. 
and Mark, my husband, is here today. I've, I'm very grateful for his support through all of this too. So he's he's on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I and I remember Mark, your great illustrations uh, from the time you guys spent in uh, Uganda. So, I mean in um, Tanzania. Tanzania. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Thank you again. Okay. Really, really Thanks. appreciate it. Thank you.